if you open your Bibles to 1 Thessalonians, we're going to start the study of a book. I haven't done a book study in a while, and it's time to come back to it. And Thessalonians is really an interesting, 1st and 2nd Thessalonians are really interesting. Uh, especially Thessalonians. Uh, because of the short time Paul was able to stay with them, and in a short period of time, he was able to create a church uh, that became a very uh, powerful, dominant church over the years. But uh, it always burdened Paul that he wasn't able to do more for them. Actually, Timothy, off from Paul's missionary team, did a great deal with them. But so Paul talks to them in his first letter. Uh, he si says, Paul and Silas, that's who Silas is. He's, his name is shortened. And Timothy, to the church of Thessalon uh, Thessalonians in God, the Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. And then this is one of Paul's course favorite salutations, grace to you and peace. Then he goes on to say, we thank God we give thanks to God always for all of you making mention of you in our prayer, constantly bearing in mind your work of faith and labor of love and steadfastness of hope. Notice faith, love, and hope. Uh, one of Paul's favorite quote, quoting ideas. And um, hope in our Lord Jesus Christ in the presence of our God and Father knowing brethren beloved by God, his choice or, or, or election of you. As far as I want to go, because I want to do an introduction with you this morning. Remember, as we open our service, the Bible is a spiritual book for spiritual people, for spiritual living. You can't learn it nor live it in carnality. Evidence of carnality is personal sin. How do I get out of carnality and back into the indwelling ministry of the Holy Spirit called spirituality? Confess my sin. 1 John 1, 9, if we confess our sins, he's faithful and just to forgive us and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Remember that confession of sin takes you back to the cross as a believer for cleansing from sin. And that's, that's for sanctification, not for salvation. That's for sanctification. That's for the ministry of the Holy Spirit that has entered your life to separate you uh, from the rest of the world of sin. And that's how you live the Christian life. You live it in the power of the indwelling Holy Spirit, i.e., you walk by faith, not by f You walk by the Holy Spirit. You walk by the Spirit and not by the flesh. So I give you a moment to do that, and then we'll get into our introduction to the book of 1 Thessalonians. It's your personal responsibility through your priesthood to confess sin, to prepare your heart for the Holy Spirit to teach and recall you the word of God of John 14, 26. Father, we're so thankful today for these who have come our way by the automobile and the internet. I pray the Holy Spirit would minister the truth of God's word to our souls today. What a wonderful thing it is for Paul to go on these great missionary trips, to take the gospel to the uttermost parts of the earth. And Paul took that challenge and did it phenomenally well when he is in his second missionary trip, Father, he gets a call to Macedonia. He's not quite sure which way to go, so he does what a believer should do. He stops and pauses and pray to you to give him direction. The Holy Spirit, through your directive, gave him the call to Macedonia, and what a wonderful ministry that turned into to be. Out of that came a lot of wonderful ministry. And one of them is in a, a wonderful seaport city called Thessalonica. A very 
very interesting city, very prosperous capital, both super highways for industry as well as ocean way. It was quite a city, and you gave it to Paul. You opened the door and gave it to Paul. And that little church became a model to other churches in the Macedonia, Archaea region. Uh, we want to study that church. We would like to be that beacon of a church, that light. And so instruct us, Father, the things that Paul instructed them, that we might have that great ministry in 2021 and further. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, let me tell you some things as we look at the book of 1 Thessalonians that's probably important for us to understand. I'm going to give six points this morning on introduction. If you have a study Bible, you'll want to go to 1 Thessalonians and study the introduction to the book of 1 Thessalonians. That, that will serve you well for this study. And so... I'm taken, for, I'm taken for granted, or at least I'm going to will it to you to be sure you study the introduction. If you have a good study Bible, look at their introduction. They will talk about many of the things I'm talking about, maybe in a little more detail, some of them. So I, I, you know, I assume that you will do that so that I can make my introduction more brief. So I want to talk about six points of introduction. First of all, Paul wrote the book of 1 Thessalonians in probably 51 AD as what most people think. But he wrote it from Corinth, which is interesting. And, and the reason is, is that when he went to Macedonia, he had great evangelism success in Macedonia. <clears throat> but with it came great persecution and conflict. He never got to stay any place very long. For example, he's only going to get to stay three Sabbaths, three Sabbaths in Thessalonica before he's forced out because of the success of the gospel changing men's hearts. And then he's going to go to Berea, and then he's going to, go, he's going to begin to go to other cities, and they're all successful in evangelism, and they are all, and he began, and great persecution comes against him in conflict and forces them out. And this is going to occur all the way through Macedonia until he gets to Corinth. I mean, he's going to do a lot of evangelism in different places. And you should read, the, you should read Paul when he gets, to, you know, the, the call of Macedonia comes in Acts 16. And then in 17, he's at Thessalonica in Acts 17. So you ought to read that. And he, he's only there three Sabbath days. Think about that. Probably less than three weeks. And he's forced out. And by the time he's out, there's been so much success in evangelism that they've been able to start a church. There, you know, there were no other churches. <laughs> I mean, he's starting a first church in the places he goes. And then he's forced out of there, and then he goes to Berea, and he's forced out of there. And, and you can follow, you can track him once he hits... It's Macedonia. You can bend to track. Now, God sent him, didn't he not? The call of Macedonia, God sent him. Just like he sends him. And listen, the gospel brings conflict from the world. Listen, Satan's not going to give up territory easy. He'll give it up easy. It's a war. Ephesians, the sixth chapter. What are, what are we fighting against? Listen, the church ought to know what you're fighting against today in America. We've had it so easy. The church has had it so easy, they don't even know what they fight anymore. But you ought to go, to, you ought to go back and read Ephesians, the 6th chapter, verse 10 and 11, down into 12, about put on the full armor of God and do combat. Listen, your warfare is not with that which you can see. It's what you can't see except through the word of God. It's an invisible warfare. My, 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 if you can see it, it's not the true war. What you're seeing is evil. You're not seeing what's promoting it. To beat it, you got to understand how to beat, how to win the angelic conflict. That's why you have to put the full armor of God on. 
Oh, I'll tell you, the church is, mine ain't any different. We're so screwy. We're so screwy about this stuff. You don't fight flesh and blood. The war is not against flesh and blood. Gee whiz. 47 years and you still ain't got it? My, my, my. Don't fight against this stuff. Is the, the warfare, you can win the warfare, but you don't fight flesh and blood. You fight the invisible war of principalities and wickedness, wickedness in high places. How do you beat them? The gospel of Jesus Christ. You put the full armor of God to fight, but your sword is what you use to win. <laughs> I, know I'm, I know I'm talking to the choir, but I got the internet. Yeah. So I'm talking to the internet as well as the congregation. Listen, this war we fight, and it's a real war, and it can be won. In fact, it's already been won when Christ died on the cross, was buried and raised from the dead, which is the gospel. When you believe it, you're already in victory. You're not in defeat. He beat the devil straight up and straight down, at the cross, when God raised her from the dead, the devil was whipped. And the great restrainer, which is talked about in 2 Thessalonians, is the Holy Spirit. The great restrainer of evil in the world is the Holy Spirit. Second, read 2 Thessalonians. You know, you can read ahead. <laughs> The Holy Spirit, listen, the great, the church has the power to restrain evil. It's called the Holy Spirit, and we can control it uh, through the Holy Spirit until the rapture of the church when he's removed. That's what I ought to be hearing some amens. <laughs> you know what I mean? This is when we all start getting happy instead of depressed. My, my, my. Well, Thessalonians, let me tell you, you're not going to carry the gospel to the world which can change their hearts. If you study Paul's, Paul's preaching, he preached a clear gospel and had clear results. People's lives were changed. That's how you get evil out of people's hearts. Boy, the church has got to know how to fight this war. You've got to know how to fight this war. And, win. and listen, you've got to fight the fight that's already been won. The devil's already been defeated. You've got to live the victory. You have to live the victory. You have to live it out. You've got to be faithful to the word of God, people. You walk by faith, not by sight. You walk in the power of the spirit, not in the flesh. These are how you win. How do you restrain evil in the world? People ask me more questions about that today. I point them to the gospel and the Holy Spirit. And they think I'm nuts. Because nobody wants to listen to the word of God anymore. Now we'd rather come up with our own theories. Word of God, buddy. It is the word of God. So point number one, wrote, Paul wrote, to th wrote the book, 1 Thessalonians, and about 51 from Corinth in Acts 18. He's in Corinth. In Acts 18, he's in Corinth. And he's going to spend 18 months in Corinth, and he's going to write 1 and 2 Thessalonians. He, he's going to do great work down there because the only time he had a chance to stop. The rest of the time, he goes in, he converts, there's a, there's a mob, a mob rises up against him and forces him out. And he takes that as negative volition and moves on to another city. Well, you ought to study Paul's journeys. They're pretty, they're pretty phenomenal. Paul, Paul, when he writes 1 Thessalonians, he's writing to a newly formed Christian church. They have a few Jews in it. They have a few, they have many, many Gentile converts, and Paul says, and many noble women. There were three groups that were identified 
uh, when you look at uh, the story of it in Acts 17. Point number two. Well, let me, let me. Listen to what Paul converted people from in 1 Thessalonians chapter 1, verse 9 and 10. That's the two last verses. For they themselves report about us what kind of reception we had with you and how you turned to God from idols to serve a living true God. That's the people he converted. That was the Gentile congregation. And then he gives them this hope. This is, this is an Ecclesiastes. Uh, Ecclesiastes. This is eschatology. Verse 10 is eschatology. And to wait, watch. How you turn to God from idols to serve a living and true God and to wait for his son from heaven whom he raised from the dead. That is Jesus who delivers us from the wrath to come. Eschatology. He's talking about the second coming of Christ. You know where your hope is today? In the second coming of Christ. You know why? You know who holds your today's? Who holds your todays? Who holds every today in your life? God, the Lord Jesus Christ. Therefore, you know who holds every tomorrow? The same person. You see, your future from the point of salvation is, the, is in the hands of God. John 10, 28 through 30. The good hands people is God, Jesus, and the Holy Spirit. Not a wonderful thing. All your todays are secured. All your tomorrows are as well because of your, listen, because the moment you believe the gospel of Jesus Christ, that he came to die for your sins, was buried and raised from the dead, he puts you in a secure position in this world, in time and eternity. What do you have to fear except fear itself? You have none. You know what's interesting about the book of 1 Thessalonians? Every chapter, like, like chapter 1, closes with eschatology. Every one of them. And what's the point? To show you that all of your todays and all of your tomorrows are secured in God. You know positional truth? It means the devil can't touch you without permission from God Almighty. See, I don't know if you really believe in security or not. Man, how do you live your daily lives? How do you live your daily life? That's where the rubber hits the pavement on security. Oh, I know if I die, I'm going to heaven. What about today? Well, I'm in a mess. Oh, my life's a mess. What about today? My life's a mess. What you going to do about it? How come your life is a mess today? Because you're not, listen, you're not paying attention to the will of God for your life. That's how, that's how your life gets all out of kilter. You ought to read Ephesians 6.6. 6. See where the will of God is in your life. Is it in your heart? Is the will of God in your heart? Well... Is it when things go tough on your life? Is your heart still with God? Huh? When you start losing things in your life, your heart's still with God? Should be because he's got your life secure. I don't know what to tell you people. Just the truth. <laughs> I'm going to tell you the truth because the truth is such you free. John 8, 32. Here's point number two. While Paul and Silas were on Paul's second missionary trip, recorded in Acts 15, 36 through the 18th chapter, verse 22, that would be a period about 50 to 52 A.D. Paul received the call to Macedonia in Acts 16, 6 through 10. Well worth. It changed. Listen, that will of God 
changed Paul's ministry forever. The call to Macedonia was to go westward with the gospel of Jesus Christ. Go westward, go westward along the Mediterranean Sea. And it was very clear to Paul that God meant for him to go all the way to Spain preaching the gospel of Jesus Christ. Listen, and when he had got there, Paul would have given him another directive will of God. I mean, how important is the will of God to your life? I'll tell you how important it is. It's how, listen, you know how you learn the will of God? Listen to me, how, you, how, do you, how, do you, how do you learn the will of God? From the word of God. The word of God takes you to the will of God. The will of God takes you to the word of God. You can see it in Paul's life. You ought to be able to see it in your own. That's why Bible study is important. And not just to hear it, but to believe it, to apply it and complete it, the faith cycle. They work their way over to Macedonia. They work their way to the seaport, the seaport city of Thessalonica, a very important city, capital, a very prosperous commercial place. Listen, and religion was there. Listen, religion follows the money. Paul didn't, but religion does. Paul and Silas began preaching the gospel of grace salvation in a local synagogue. You know, the wonderful thing about Paul, he was trilingual. He was fluent in Hebrew, Latin, and Greek. I don't know about his teachings in Hebrew and Latin, but I can tell you one thing. He really was a master teacher of the Greek. Wow. Wow. Was he ever good. If you're a preacher and you didn't like going through the Greek classes first, second, third year, and it and you couldn't wait to graduate and not ever look at it again, boy, did you miss your calling. Because when you study Paul, he's a master of the Greek language. And I'll show it to you. I'll show you a little bit of it today. A master of the Greek language. I get so excited when I study Paul's re writings in the Greek language because I have to pull all my Greek books out. I have to pull them all out, and I have to study all of them to get understand where he is going with this. It's phenomenal. You ought to study with me in my, in my teachings on this book of Thessalonica. You ought to be with me on my Wednesday studies as I'm going into uh, my 47th lesson on spiritual gifts because I'm still learning out of the Greek language that Paul writes. He's a phenomenal writer, and I will show you some, some phenomenal Greek over the next couple of weeks on my Wednesday study. He's just so good. Well, you ought to read in your time at home, Acts 17, 1, through two, uh, one and 2. Oh, let me just read it. Let me just show you a little bit. You can, you can pick up the second trip of Paul and when he gets to Thessalonica, let me just pick up a couple. I'm in the 17th chapter. And it, it shows how Paul's travel has, has taken him. If you go back earlier uh, into the 16th chapter where he gets a call to Macedonia, then he immediately goes to Macedonia. And you see the different cities he's going through until he comes to Thessalonica. And he meets in a, in a, in a synagogue of the Jews according to the, Paul's custom. He looked for Jews, a synagogue. Uh, 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 he went to them, and watch this now, and this is all he got to say, and for three Sabbaths reasoned with them from the scriptures, which was the Old Covenant, the Old Testament, and explaining and giving evidence that Christ had to suffer, that is, die on the cross for their sins, rise again from the dead. See, that's the gospel saying, Jesus, whom I proclaim to you, is the Christ. That's where, that's where he started. And uh, then uh, a hornet's nest started, and you can read the rest about how you got booted out of town. Okay? 
I read, I read part of it. I wrote more to you on your paper. And uh, some of them, I don't know where S-R-O-P, yeah, I have no idea what that is, but that should be some. And some of them, the Jews were persuaded. This is, this is in verse 4 of Acts 17 on your paper. And joined Paul and Silas, along with large number of God-fearing Gentiles, that's, that's Gentiles who were positive. Listen, a lot of them were pagan. He told you they were pagans. But they were positive, had positive listen for God consciousness. Positive listen for God consciousness. And a number of leading women. That was, that's who made up the church. A few Jews, many Gentiles, and some noble women of the city. Three groups made up the church. That's what, that's what we learned from that. Point number three. Within three Sabbaths, possibly three weeks, you know, we're talking about a Sabbath, you know, a Saturday is the last day, first day of the week. You know what's interesting in the Bible? They don't, you, your days of your week are not called by names. They're called by numbers. The first day of the week was called the first day of the week because the seventh day closed out that week. Saturday closed out that week. And so what we call Sunday was day one. Then you got day two, day three, day four. We call it, they call them by days. They didn't call them. We call it Sunday, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday. It's okay. I mean, I don't care. I'm just, I mean, I call it Sunday, Monday, Tuesday, and Wednesday. You know, if, if you could say, well, I, listen, I'll meet you for lunch on day three. You know, it just doesn't ring a bell. So culturally, we do that, and I'm okay with that, but, you know, it's not biblical. So we got the Sabbath. You know what Sabbath is? Even though it was on the seventh day, Sabbath doesn't mean seven. It means the day of rest. Talking about rest in God. Bob Thiem called faith rest. That's where he got the whole concept. It was from the seventh day. I guess you know that. Anyhow, <laughs> three Sabbaths. We know what that means because we can add up numbers. You know, we can, we can count to seven. We got that down. And so when you look at that, then you, you see, if you read the rest of, of uh, Acts 17, like 5 through 10, now you see after he's preached the gospel and a church has formed, a group of people have formed to study. Then a mob, a mob attacks and now we've got Bedlam. You know why? Listen, because the devil runs the show. You understand that? He's not going to give up that territory. You come in there, okay. You come in there and do that little bit because God sent them. And so now what are they going to do? They can't do anything. They can't stop what God, has, what God has started. Here's what they can do. They can cause a mess of it. Mob rioting and persecution. Guess where that comes from? I don't care who does it. Guess where it comes from? Guess who promotes it? And how are you going to fight that? Of course it comes from Satan. I don't care who's promoted by it. I don't know. I care who's involved in it. It's evil. And who promotes it? The question for the church is how do you fight it? Listen, the war's already been won. You've got to know how to walk in the park. Listen, the only restrainer of evil in the world of the church age is the Holy Spirit. You've got to read 2 Thessalonians. There's only three chapters. Come on. Skip one goofy TV program and read that little book. You're not going to get anything decent out of there anyhow unless it's Monday night at 7 o'clock. Then we'll see how that goes. So three Sabbaths, after three Sabbaths, they're forced out by rioting and mobs and persecution. But a famous quote comes from 1 Thessalonians. In the midst of all this mess, something good came out of this mess. A famous quote. Officials blaming the mob rioting on Paul and Silas. 
they, they blamed them for the rioting. Had they not come and cited the people with the gospel of Jesus Christ, you know we're coming to this day, don't you know we're coming to this day, dear heart? They call preaching the gospel, inciting people to give their life to Christ, inciting people to get saved. They blamed them for the rioting that was going on in the city, which they promoted. That's what you call evil. And Paul got that everywhere he went. And you know what? He still went. Here's the famous quote. Here's what these officials said. Here was their charge against the gospel of Jesus Christ. These men have turned the world upside down and have now come here to do it to us. They, they are blaming the gospel of Jesus Christ for the rioting that was promoted from the community. Oh, boy, you're going to need 1 Thessalonians, dear heart. Those of you, listen, those of you on the Internet from other parts of the world, you know what I'm preaching because you're you, you having it. You're having it. You go preach the gospel of God, they'll shut you down so quick. And if you don't shut it down right away, they'll persecute to the end degree. There's your China and other places. Soon to come to America. Soon to come to America. Do you know this little church has been censored a couple times? In the world, would anybody censor me? I'm the most non-political person in a pulpit you would ever meet. <laughs> it's coming to America. It's already here. And you better know how to fight evil. Because you don't know how. And that's my responsibility. And I'm going to teach it to you out of these books. And I'm going to tell you, it's not going to be any tougher than what I'm going to tell you. The restrainer of evil is the Holy Spirit of God in your life working dynamically and powerfully. And we, when we do it collectively, we have an enormous impact. It's called the church. Actually, the gospel of grace salvation turns the world upside right. It turns it upright. The gospel of Jesus. See, they, they were so, they, listen, they were, they were born upside down. They lived upside down. You did too. Everybody under Adam's sin is born upside down. It is the gospel of Jesus Christ that sets up, up, upside Upright and righteous. Upright and righteous. Downside and unrighteous. Upside and righteous. The gospel of Jesus Christ is able to turn your world. Didn't it yours? It did mine. <laughs> Buddy, I understand this thing. I knew I was upside down and unrighteous. That's why I came to Christ for salvation. And he turned my life upright and righteous. You would have thought that everybody that knew Ron Adema would love this transition, would love the change in Ron Adema. They didn't and don't because they don't believe it. Converted in 1961. 
have not looked back. People still do not believe that it's real in my life. <laughs> Is that not funny? They say, it don't matter to me. It's important that I know it's real in my life, right? I know it's real. I know how much my life's been changed daily for Christ. I know it. I really know deep in my soul, like you do, that God has made him, Christ, who knew no sin, to become sin on my behalf so that Ron Adama might become the righteousness of God in him and not on my own. Not on my own. There's <laughs> no way I could have ever climbed out of the pit I was in on my own. And nobody knew it better than me. You know, bondage is a terrible thing, especially when you know you're in it. Here's a doctrinal point. Apostate politicians and religious leaders are afraid of having men's hearts changed by the gospel of grace salvation. Let me give you a classic example of this. Luke, the eighth chapter, in Luke, the eighth chapter, 36 through 39, there's a guy there called a demoniac. He lived in a cemetery. Remember that story? When you go home today, you read this, because this, this is America. This is America. Jesus hit the shore for that one man so his disciples would understand how you went over sin, the devil, and evil. He went in there and turned that man's right side up and righteous. Agreed? Remember all the pigs and the, all the demons in him had a name called legions. That's a whole lot of demons. They were in control of the territory. You know, the city, they chained them up and did all these kind of things. You know, they used all their psychology they could use on them. Listen, that just feeds the devil, the demons. They didn't do any good. They tried everything with him. Only one cure for a demoniac guy like that, literally in bondage. Figured to him, literally, is the gospel of Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ can set your world right side up. But you got to believe it. The demons had a fuss with Jesus. We're not giving up. He said, shut up and come out of him. It probably took a pretty good while for a whole legion to jump out of him, right? Everybody sat down and had a hamburger while it was happening. Then the city was amazed that he was in his right mind. Wanted to know where his clothes were. They, the city couldn't believe it. What has happened to this man? He's been changed by the power of the gospel of Christ. You know what they did? They demanded that Jesus leave their shores. They demanded that Jesus get out of their culture and their country. They would rather have a demoniac man with legions and pigs than the Lord Jesus Christ. You ought to read that story. It's coming to America. You should read this story. It's coming to America. You should read this story. Unless, unless we get battle weary, we need to get the full armor of God out and begin to fight with a proper a proper understanding how to beat what's going on in America today. If you're not willing to take the gospel to the streets, 
to the highway and the hedges, you can forget America, just go home and go to bed, take a couple pills, and, and wait to die. Because the only way you turn a mess like this right side up is the gospel of Jesus Christ has to be preached, and Christians have to live battle ready. Onward, Christian soldiers. No wonder they took it out of the hymn book. No wonder they never sing that song anymore. My, my, my. I imagine we'll get cut off somewhere today. I don't know. Point number four. Paul and Silas fled to Berea and evangelized it in Acts 17, 11, and 13, uh, 11 through 15. And guess what happened? They were forced out. Because the gospel was setting everything upside right. Paul and Silas left Timothy at Berea and traveled. Paul he left Silas and Timothy at Berea, and Paul traveled on alone to Athens, which rejected the teaching of the resurrection of Jesus Christ. And he left without persecution because he didn't preach the gospel to him. And he traveled on uh, to, to Corinth. What is interesting is Silas and Timothy rejoined Paul at Corinth in Acts 18.5. And then Timothy was sent back to oversee the Macedonian ministries while Paul ministered in Ephesus. 1 Thessalonians 3.2. We sent Timothy, our brother our, and God's fellow worker in the gospel of Christ to strengthen and encourage you, that's the infant local church of Thessalonica, as to your faith, sent them back to teach them further in a word so that they would be able to fight the good fight of faith. That was a high call for Timothy, wasn't it? Boy, did Paul put a lot of, a lot, a lot of, a, a lot of emphasis on that young man. Point number five. First and second Thessalonians are known by, by Bible students for their eschatology, teaching on the second coming, or in this case, the rapture. For example, every chapter of First Thessalonians with a message of eschatology. I wrote them down for you so you wouldn't miss them. One of the most famous passages in First Thessalonians on the rapture is First Thessalonians 4, 13 through 18. Paul used eschatology to assure believers that their future was secured in the hands of God. There's your main purpose of eschatology. Now let me close with verse 6. I want to show you something about the phenomenal Greek of Paul. I want you to go to verse 2 with me, where he says, we give thanks to God. And then I've written everything else on your paper, but I wanted to show you the phenomenal Greek of the Apostle Paul. This is phenomenal. In verse 2, he says, we give thanks. He uses a word where we get Eucharist from, the giving of thanks. Now listen to me, this is important in Greek. Greek. That's a main verb. We give thanks is a main verb. It's a present active indicative. First person plural, we. It's a main verb. Now, the next verse 2 is going to have a participle, a PTC. Verse 3 is going to have a participle, a PTC. Verse 4 is going to have a participle, PTC. And four is going to have a participle. See the PTC on the verb? P yeah, that's a participle. It's an abbreviation for participle. Listen to me. The action of the main verb, all the participles are working with the main verb. There's four of them. Agreed? Now listen to me. One in verses one and two, verses chapter one, verse two and three are both present participles. Did you see that? They're present participles. 
So I, I want you to circle first chapter 2 and 3. Just put a circle around it because both of those are present participles. They're working off that main verb now, a present active indicative. Now go down to 3 and 4. Go down to 3 and 4. Go down to uh, four, uh, 4. Go down to 4. So you circle two and three, just the numbers, just circle the numbers where you know that both of those are present participle. Now look down in verse four, you have two perfect participles. Do you see that? Yes. Two perfect participles. See, we give thanks, perfect active participle. We give thanks, right? Right? They're all, all of them are participles which are linked to the main verb. A participle is linked to a main verb. The first two things that Paul tells them are present participles. He says, we give thanks to God always for you. Number two, meaning we give thanks, main verb. We give thanks, making mention of you in our prayers. He's talking about their conversion. Paul they have Paul's heart. You are, I helped you, I helped give birth to you, to God. And you are a special place in my life. And in my prayers, I pray for you, present tense, constantly. I always remember our experience together when your life was changed by the gospel of Jesus Christ and how exciting that life is in Christ for you. I know that. I was there at your birth. I was there in the joy of it. You have a special place in my heart because of it. And I pray continuously for you. That Both of those is present tense. Present participles. That's what's going on right now. But when he comes to verse 4, he puts him in the perfect participle. A perfect, a perfect tense means something completed in the past. I mean completed, done, completed in the past. With the results, it remains completed in the presence and forever if it's connected to God. Is this connected to God? Oh, uh, yeah. I mean, he just told you that. We give thanks for you and God. He's still giving thanks because of the main verb. See, that's the reason I kept writing it. See? We give thanks knowing, brethren. We give thanks, beloved. We give thanks, chosen. You know what those are? Listen to me now. This is what Paul, Paul, Paul is teaching. Paul is saying, I love the fact up in the present part of so I, I came and preached the gospel. You received it. You got saved. I'm so excited for that in your life. And I'm praying continuously for you, for your walk in the Lord. Be strong. Fight the good fight of faith. Then he goes back to what has happened to their life once they got saved. What was it that changed their world from downside to upside in the gospel of Jesus Christ? Their character was changed positionally. What's he call them? He calls them by three titles that can never change in time and eternity. He calls them by three names. He calls them brethren. You know why? Because they belong to the royal family of God. We're all brothers in Christ because we have the same father. What's the second one? Beloved. He calls them beloved. You know why? Because they are positionally in Christ, the beloved son of God. They are the beloved sons of God. Those are, these are positional truths. They, listen, in the little pamphlet, 50 things you can never lose in time and eternity. Man, you ought to carry one of them with you. I give, more th I give them more away in conversation with people than you could imagine. There's 20 status privileges in there that every believer receives at the point of salvation. Three of them are mentioned here. Brethren, 
a title you can never lose in time and eternity. Beloved, a title you can never lose. Chosen of God, elected. Chosen of God, never can change. He encourages us. Listen, live who you are in Christ, not who the world says you are. Live who God says you are. You're a brother. Be part of the brotherhood of Christ. You are the beloved. Never let anybody tell you that you are not the beloved son of God. You have been chosen. You've been chosen. You've been called for a purpose within the plan of God. Stand tall. Be accountable to Christ. Beloved, chosen, brethren. <laughs> Didn't he do that neat? Put a main verb up there as a present act and indicative. Three, four participles work off from them. Two of them in the present tense, two in the perfect tense. To say to them, you are secure in God's hand. You will always be secure. You are a brethren. You'll always be our brother in Christ. You're part of the royal family. You'll be always part of the royal family. You're a beloved son of God. You'll always be a beloved son of God. What do they do to you? And you'll always be chosen of God. Always you're the chosen of God. My, my, my. Preach to us, Paul. Preach to us. He did that in the, listen, he did that in the Greek language. My, my, my. What a wonderful teacher of the language. Four verses, and boy, were they powerful by the way he set them up. Point one, point two, separated three and four. Well, anyhow. We're headed into Thessalonians, and you're going to need it. We are going to need it. And, and rightly so. Listen, it's okay. We live in the devil's world, but we live victorious, not defeated. <laughs> we do live in the devil's world. Well, gee whiz. If for no other verse, read 1 John 5, 19. But we live victorious. Don't let the devil tell you that you can't live victorious because you, li you can live above what's going on. And you can be a messenger for God of how to, how, how to live in midst of evil. And what restrains it and how you went over it. Father, we're so thankful today for this book. Must be important, Father. It was canonized. And we believe it. We believe it's a book for the hour to remind us of es the importance of eschatology in the midst of soteriology, the preaching of the gospel of Christ. We must always season it in eschatology. I find that interesting in that book. I want you to encourage our hearts today, Father. It is not what we read in the news or what we hear on the television. It's what we read in the word of God that gives us comfort. It's what we read in the word of God, dear Father. Encourage our hearts to be more word-oriented and more gospel-oriented. And we know where our security is in this life. It is in good hands. It is in great hands. In Jesus' name, amen.